Good morning from Washington, D.C., and good evening to all of those of you who are joining us from Tokyo. Thank you for joining us for today's policy briefing, Japan as Relevant as Ever, The Economist Special Report on Reiwa Japan, featuring Mr. Noah Snyder, Tokyo Bureau Chief of The Economist. My name is Shanti Shoji, Director of Programs at Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Sasakawa USA is a nonpartisan 501c3 organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening the relationship between the US and Japan for the benefit of a free and open international community. Our activities mainly focus on security and diplomacy through the exchange of uh, dialogue, analysis, publications, and networking. Today's event is being recorded and is on the record. We will have a video recording and written recap on our Sasakawa USA website in the coming weeks. Um, as you may know, there will be time for Q&A later in the program, and you can submit your questions in the Q&A chat function anytime throughout uh, the program, and we will um, get through those at the end of the program. And with that, I would like to turn over the program to Dr. Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman and President of Sasakawa USA. A Happy New Year. I hope you and your family had a wonderful holiday season. I am Satohiro Akimoto, President and Chairman of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. I am delighted to see you all. As we begin the new year, we are presenting a perfect program today to put Japan in a grand perspective. Many of, it, many of us in this virtual room live long enough to experience or witness Japan's high growth eras in the 60s and 70s, bubble economy in the 80s, and then bubble burst, and the last two decades in which Japan stagnates, shrinks, and doesn't seem to go anywhere. It is only recently people started to have a second look at Japan, but mainly in context of national security concerns with China. We are all busy with what's happening every day in our lives, but I think it's worthwhile to step back and think about what's next for Japan in rare period. I read the Economist special report, Japan as relevant as ever last December. I immediately got in touch with Noah Snyder to talk about present, presenting his views on Japan in Reiwa at the Sasakawa USA, as I thought the report was insightful and well-balanced to make sense of changing aspect of Japan. I'm honored and feel fortunate to give to begin 2022 with an event with Noah Snyder. Noah is an economist, Tokyo bureau chief covering politics, business, society, culture. The special report is a testimony to his mastery of everything important in Japan. He actually specialized in Russian and East European studied studies at the Pomona College and was Moscow correspondent for the economists before he came to Japan. He's the third generation of his family to live and work in Japan. In that context, I just wanted to say a word for his father, Dan Snyder, a friend of mine for a long time. He's in, in attendance today, so welcome, Dan. We met each other in the 1980s in Tokyo when he was a young, aspiring journalist. Dan became a longtime foreign correspondent for Christian Science Monitor and San Jose Mercury before he became associate director for Walter Sonstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford. He's currently writing a book on his father, Richard Snyder, who was a US ambassador to South Korea and worked on the US Asia policy, including return of Okinawa to Japan as deputy assistant secretary of state. And of course, Dan is a proud father of Noah. A short message before we begin. For those, I don't do commercial, but for those who have not read, read the special report yet, it was published in the December 11th edition of The Economist. Subscribers can find it on The Economist website and back issues of the printed edition and the PhD editions of, his, of the special report alone are available on the website. So I am excited to have Noor today. Noah, floor is yours. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, san for the kind introduction and, and to all of you at uh, Sasakawa for the invitation to, to speak to uh, your distinguished distinguished audience uh, today. So uh, for, for, for all of us at The Economist, these special reports are, you know, as, as you say, really a chance to, to step back, um, to step back from the, the, the cadence of our weekly or, or daily coverage and, and to take a big picture look at a given topic or country. Um, the special reports about single countries are, are relatively rare. And, and in fact, the last one we published about Japan uh, was in, in back in 2010. Um, so it's a, it's a chance to sort of reflect on the, the meta narrative, uh, as, as it were, for, for uh, a given country at a given historical juncture, and, and to offer our readers a, a, a lens uh, for seeing that country in, in the years to come. Um, it's also, I should say, for, for us correspondents, a chance to do the kind of concentrated, in-depth reporting and writing that can be um, difficult to do alongside normal coverage. So we, we get a, a month more than a month off from our regular responsibilities to, to focus on these projects. Um, so this one took me to, to more than a dozen cities and towns across Japan from uh, Akita Prefecture in the north to Yonaguni in the southwest. Uh, it involved uh, speaking with, conducting interviews with more than 150 people uh, in the end, politicians, activists, scholars, CEOs, generals, priests, uh, fruit sellers, sake brewers, uh, and, and, uh, and many more. Uh, and I think this was an especially useful format for, for writing about Japan, which um, is a place that, is, as uh, uh, many of you in the audience know better than I, um, you know, change tends to be incremental and, and gradual. It's the, the sort of change that modern media with our 24-hour news cycles um, is, are, are ill-suited to capture. Um, but, but when you do sort of step back and, and notch up the developments over a, a decade or so, things start to, um, to take shape. Uh, and this also seemed an especially natural moment to, to take stock of Japan. Um, we've, we've had the end of, of Abe Shinzo's record long tenure as prime minister, uh, the passing of the long awaited Tokyo Olympics and, and the start of the Reiwa imperial era. So, so it's a natural moment really to, to ask what's, what's the story for, for today's Japan. Um, there are two stories that are, that are often told about Japan. Um, one is kind of an extension of, of the one that uh, 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 Akimoto-san mentioned, the, 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 the lost decades narrative of, of a nation in decline, a shrinking aging population, an, an economy sapped of its vitality uh, in, in sort of eternal stagnation. Um, and the second story is, is uh, uh, one of a alluring, hyper-functional, um, but kind of eccentric, uh, weird society, a nice place to eat sushi, explore strange subcultures, but so different to be as, as uh, uh, of little relevance to, to, to the outside world. Uh, and, and both of those stories um, lead people to look away from Japan, to, to, to dismiss Japan. Um, this special report argues that, that that's a mistake, um, that Japan is, is not an outlier, it's a harbinger. Um, and that as Japan moves into the Reiwa era, it's as relevant uh, uh, really at, at any time uh, since the, the, the end of the Second World War. Um, that's not because Japan is number one again. Uh, uh, it's not a, 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 an argument for, for, for reprisal of, of uh, the, the Showa era narrative. Um, Japan is relevant now because it stands on the front line of, of a host of common challenges. Um, population decline, rapid aging, secular stagnation, disaster risk, megacity management, um, and the peril of, of being caught between China and, and America. Um, these are all sort of uh, uh, conditions that were once maybe seen as, as, as uh, those of, of an idiosyncratic patient, um, but we've, we've seen them become endemic for many, especially in the rich world. Um, they, they simply hit Japan a bit earlier. Um, so I think a, a, a more sort of fitting uh, identity or more fitting uh, uh, story for Japan in, in Reiwa is, is what Komiyama Sensei, the, the former president of Todai, calls uh, Kadai Senshin Koku, or, or, or an advanced in challenges country. Um, and this position, of course, on, on the front line is not necessarily something Japan itself consciously engineered. Um, it's it's a, you know, about proximity, not prescience, but um, the fact that some of these, these problems or some of these challenges hit Japan early on makes it a useful laboratory, I think, for, for observing their, their effects and, and working out 
uh, how to respond. Um, Japan's successes can, can serve as models and its failures can, can serve as, as cautionary tales. Uh, but as, as uh, uh, Philip Lipsy of the University of Toronto put it to me quite um, uh, perfectly, I think uh, we, we treat Japan as unique uh, at our own peril. Um, th there's a, a sense, I think, also that, that uh, 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 as, as uh, Akimoto-san mentioned, um, that, that people are starting to um, uh, look again at Japan and, 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 and to notice perhaps some of the ways that, that Japan is changing. Um, and I think one of the, the central um, arguments of, of, this, uh, of this project is that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of change happening um, from, from the bottom up that, that isn't perhaps as visible uh, at the national level um, that, that the central government, uh, as uh, uh, Yanai Tadashi, the, the CEO and founder of Fast Retailing, put it to me, the central government is sort of running behind the times and um, that there are, uh, uh, there's a show a generation top the country, but uh, those who follow um, uh, have perhaps a, a different outlook, different values, uh, and a different vision for um, uh, where Japan will go. Um, so what I'd like to do today is, is to run through, and, and, and there are quite a lot of themes um, that the report covers, but um, I'd like to kind of jump through them and, and to lay out um, a handful of points uh, uh, that I found most interesting or relevant uh, in the course of, of, of my reporting. Um, and the place uh, uh, to start is, is with foreign and, and security policy. And, and um, for that, I'd like to take us on a, a, a trip, as it were, to, um, to Yonaguni. Um, when you fly out to Yonaguni, uh, commercially at least, uh, um, on JAL, you get uh, these uh, uh, cute little maps with all the um, uh, local flora and fauna. You see the uh, Yonaguni horse um, pulled out uh, 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 in particular. Um, but for, for all of the sort of laid back um, island vibes, um, there is a palpable sense of worry um, on the island. Um, on the one hand, worry about China uh, and its aggression. Uh, and on the other hand, worry about America and its ambivalence. Uh, and I think that that uh, those two forces uh, um, and 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 the rivalry between uh, uh, China and America, if, if if that is the big story in in twenty first century geopolitics, um, uh, Japan clearly has a, a big role um, to play. Uh, and that realization, um, again, as as many of you uh, know uh, uh, know all too well, has 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 meant a lot of rethinking about Japan's role. Uh, and a recognition that though there, there can be no substitute for America, that Japan must supplement American power in order to, to, to maintain a favorable balance uh, in the region. Um, so what it adds up to for, for sort of Rewa Japan's role, um, I'd, I'd, I'd point to three, um, uh, three elements in particular. One is, is this shift from a sort of one pillar to a multi-pillar architecture as, as uh, uh, Tanaka Sensei of, of GRIPS put it to me, um, you know, moving from, from US-centric policy to a more diversified policy, um, but at the same time, keeping America close. This, this is not about turning away from America, it's about um, uh, doing more to keep America anchored in the region. Um, it's about deterring China, but um, not antagonizing China. Uh, Japan knows all too well uh, uh, how uh, dependent its economy is on the Chinese economy. Um, so uh, uh, it's it's a balance that's that's hard to strike and may prove even harder to strike in the future. But uh, I think that's the the aim, uh, and I think the the what comes through uh, talking to folks uh, uh, about how this 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 new role emerged is that that it's really a story of, of evolution, not revolution. Um, it's not the story of, of sort of uh, Abe uh, Abe era revisionism as as it's sometimes cast. Um, but a, a story of Japan's incremental transformation. And I think talking to policymakers, um, senior policymakers today, uh, it, it's really clear what a formative moment um, the first Gulf War was and, and, and uh, how um, uh, perhaps even traumatic um, uh, the experience of, of Japan's um, uh, role or, or lack thereof in, 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 um, uh, in that in, in, in that historical moment was. Uh, more recently, obviously, China has been a catalyst. Um, we saw that uh, with the, the uh, early on with the, the uh, Senkaku crises in, in, in 2010, 11, and 12. Um, and uh, it's you know, a perception that, that, uh, that the perception of China's threat is something that formed in Japan earlier than elsewhere, but um, it has become 
uh, uh, shared uh, since. Um, and similarly, uh, questions about or worries about America's um, reliability or, or, or America's commitment uh, are longstanding here in, in Tokyo. And, and you can hear the litany going back to, uh, as one uh, of my conversation partners reminded me, um, uh, uh, the time when Bill Clinton skipped an APEC meeting uh, in the week that it later emerged he began his affair with Monica Lewinsky. So no time for Asia, but plenty of time to play around elsewhere. Um, so what, what has changed in practice? Um, Japan knows it must do more. Um, uh, what has that meant? Um, again, three, three key points, I think. Uh, one is, is uh, the change to the legal frameworks um, uh, uh, governing uh, uh, the Japanese self-defense forces, um, a, a loosening of the limits. Obviously, there are still restrictions, but um, they are much more flexible than they once were, and that has meant more space to plan and train realistically. Um, uh, I would, would argue that the, the, the main um, remaining limits are in fact political. Um, Japanese leaders have tools to act now. Um, the, 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 the issue is that it will still require a political decision to act. And I think that's something that um, worries um, senior policymakers here. Um, you know, will the public be on board if, if, um, if they decide they need to, and, and will perhaps their coalition partners, um, certainly uh, LDP folks are, are thinking about this with, with respect to Cometo. Um, the second thing that's changed is, is clearly the SDF's posture, and you, you see that in the map on the right, um, you know, new bases established uh, uh, in the Nansei Islands, uh, a lot of resources being poured into that region. Um, but I think folks, uh, uh, and certainly the, the generals whom I spoke with, um, would be the first to admit that um, while a lot has been done, it's, it's uh, still not uh, enough. Um, and finally, the, the sort of diversification of security partnerships. Um, we saw this week the signing of the Reciprocal Access Agreement with Australia. Uh, we've seen more cooperation with, with uh, India through the Quad, uh, a host of European countries um, bringing their warships um, through Japan. Um, so that's clearly, uh, 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 clearly a focus uh, and will continue to be a focus going forward. Um, I think there's also an understanding in, in, in Japan that competition with China is multidimensional and, and that ASEAN and, and, and Southeast Asia is, is a key theater there. Um, uh, talking to folks um, uh, in Southeast Asia, there's a real um, respect for and, and uh, uh, understanding of Japan's role there. Um, you know, China's BRI gets a lot more attention, but um, Japanese companies and, and the Japanese government agencies have, have um, worked to build up a big stock of, of investment in, in ASEAN's infrastructure. And uh, there are, are, are a host of polls that show Japan is, is you know, the most trusted or one of the most trusted big powers amongst Southeast Asians. Um, and I think the, there, there are two points um, that, that really come through talking to uh, Japanese policymakers and Japanese uh, executives who, who work in the region, um, uh, uh, messages as it were for, for their friends um, in the US. And, and the first is that America's approach um, from, from Japan's perspective can be too inflexible when it comes to, to Southeast Asia, that, that the sort of aversion to state-owned enterprises um, makes it hard to, um, hard to get involved in, in, uh, uh, in infrastructure projects in particular. Um, and second, that, that uh, uh, the tendency to, to um, talk in ideological terms, to talk about you know, competition between democracy and authoritarianism uh, can make things tricky in, in a region where um, many strategic partners um, uh, are not democracies or certainly not perfect democracies. Um, and this, this kind of allegiance to, to Cold War style blocks, to choosing between um, China and America is, is, uh, uh, is something uh, to be avoided. And, and, I think the, re the reason, one of the reasons why folks uh, in Tokyo um, feel that way is because uh, Japanese business um, feels that way too. Uh, Japanese business doesn't want to choose to be uh, uh, on America's side or China's side. And, and that has sort of informed the, the approach to decoupling uh, here as well, which, which is, is clearly decidedly um, selective. Um, so what, what next um, in, in Rewa? Um, three challenges in, in particular, uh, well, uh, uh, three challenges and, and, and uh, um, uh, one addendum, but uh, the black hole that is relations with, with South Korea um, would be one. Um, maintaining this, this balancing act um, with regards to China would be a second. Um, uh, you know, officials here who I talked to are, are um, uh, you know, clearly worried that um, she has, has 
basically not decided yet what he wants to do with Japan, but that things could get um, more turbulent in the coming years. Um, so that, that sort of delicate dance of deterring but not provoking, of, of enjoying economic uh, uh, fruits, but um, denouncing political ills is, is, uh, is going to become, uh, I think, more, more difficult to maintain. Um, Taiwan, in, in, in particular, of course, um, uh, uh, is, is, is of great interest, but I think uh, conversations here um, make clear a few things. Um, one is that um, the assessments about um, the, the, the risks of, of all out invasion uh, of Taiwan are, are a little bit different here um, in, in Japan than, than um, some of the dialogue in, in the US would suggest. Um, you know, less uh, equivocal about um, the timelines or, or the risks um, there and, and, and more worried about kind of gray zone scenarios, uh, outer lying islands, uh, cyber and, 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 and otherwise. Um, so, so this, this sort of uh, uh, spectrum is, is, is maybe, um, spectrum of worries is maybe slightly different um, than, than in the US. Um, finally, uh, the security priorities, the newfound sort of uh, uh, appetite for, for more um, uh, robust international role is, is obviously going to come up against um, domestic priorities. And, and it's a, a, an irony of sorts that Japan has, has become more proactive internationally at, at exactly the time when its relative economic strength is slipping. So, you know, it, its economy is still, of course, the world's third largest, but um, the, the trajectory is going to force some difficult choices about um, priorities in, in the future. Um, I, I'd like to turn now to those domestic challenges uh, and, and to start with disasters. Um, we all know that Japan is disaster prone. We've got earthquakes and tsunamis, typhoons, floods, landslides, uh, volcanic eruptions. Um, uh, as as uh, one of my interviews put it, uh, Japan's a, a department store of, of natural hazards. Um, you can, can get them all here. Um, but what has happened really is that the, the rest of the world is becoming more like Japan uh, in that respect. Um, as uh, this, this graph shows, um, uh, uh, the, the threat from natural hazards is, is growing uh, from climate change fueled fires and storms to zoonotic pandemics. Um, you know, the world is having to learn to live with more risk, which is a position that, that Japan has been in for quite some time. Um, so what, you know, what can be learned um, from Japan's experience? Uh, I, I think the key lesson is resilience. Um, the idea of resilience and, and the idea of, of, of building uh, society, building a building communities, designing systems that are, are um, able to absorb and, and bounce back from shocks. Um, and it's important to remember that this is not innate. This is not something uh, essentially Japanese. It's the product of experience. And, and you don't have to go back that far um, uh, uh, to see big changes, um, even here in Japan. So if you go back to, for example, to Kobe, uh, in 1995. Um, on the left, you see the, the sort of remnants of the big earthquake uh, that struck there. Um, and, you know, talking to people in the city about um, uh, uh, the response at the time, it's very clear that, that most communities, most individuals um, didn't expect this to happen, didn't think it would happen to them, and, and didn't know what they were going to do when it did happen. Um, uh, and what Japan and, and what Kobe and, and Japan learned um, uh, uh, in the wake of that was a, a lesson about the value of um, preparation. Um, this sounds banal, but of course, um, preparedness matters. Um, uh, it sounds banal, but um, sadly, it's, it's all too rare in practice. Uh, this graph here shows the share of international aid, that, that uh, disaster-related aid um, that goes uh, to you know, disaster risk reduction, so, so prevention and preparedness, um, the tiny dark green um, splotch at the bottom um, versus emergency response and sort of reconstruction and, and relief. So, you know, donors prefer high profile rescue work, the media, we, you know, cover disasters when they happen, not when they don't. Um, and many governments still treat prevention as a cost, not an investment. Um, Japan is, is a, a, um, if not an exception, um, sort of at the, the, the leading edge um, in, in, um, in thinking about prevention and in, in, in really leading um, that agenda internationally. Um, you know, hazards don't have to mean um, disasters. Uh, so looking at, at 
you know, the systems Japan has built, I think there are three layers, um, three important layers. One is, is a governance layer. So talking about uh, planning at, at, at the government levels, contingency planning, um, uh, building uh, systems, for example, for, for you know, prearranged contracts so that infrastructure can be repaired um, immediately when a disaster strikes and you don't have to haggle over procurement um, uh, in the midst of it. Um, doing things like stockpiling essential goods uh, uh, at the local level, um, designing public spaces, designing parks um, uh, with disasters in mind. Um, uh, the second is, is a sort of hard infrastructure layer. So uh, the government here has obviously invested a lot in engineering based solutions, um, you know, building codes uh, uh, have helped reduce risks from earthquakes. Um, uh, the, the, the built environment generally has become uh, less dangerous here uh, in, in the last uh, 20, 25 years. Um, but at the same time, um, as, as you know, 311 in particular has shown, uh, even the best hardware fails and, and, and over-reliance on technology can create a sort of false sense of security. So uh, that brings, brings us to the, the, that sort of third layer, the soft infrastructure layer, um, which is to say people and communities. Um, there's a, a, a growing body of, of uh, social science research, both here in Japan and, and uh, uh, in the US that, that really points to the role of social capital when disasters strike. Um, you know, it's community ties uh, uh, that make the difference um, uh, in times of crisis. Um, and and it's, it's people's sense uh, of their own responsibility and, and awareness of, of um, uh, their own um, uh, behaviors uh, that, that, that uh, often determines outcomes as much as things like um, uh, income levels or, or, or um, demographics or, or, or even topography. So uh, I think we see this, you know, for example, with, with COVID-19 and, and uh, people like to talk a lot about the role of, of uh, you know, social norms and social pressure and conformity in terms of, of the prevalence of, of ubiquity of mask wearing here in Japan. Um, but I think a, another potential uh, explanation for it is, is simply the fact that, that um, there is a, a much deeper awareness uh, in Japanese society um, that, that when disaster strikes, it is everyone's business um, uh, than perhaps there is elsewhere, um, well, certainly at least in, in um, uh, sadly, uh, in, in the US. Um, Going forward, uh, those uh, stores of resilience are going to be needed ever more. Um, you know, Japan's climate policy has um, uh, 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 sadly lagged, um, despite the, the, the declaration uh, or the intention to sort of get to net zero by 2050. Um, you know, energy policy uh, is, is still pretty dirty when you look at, at Japan's um, insistence on, on, on holding on to coal as a, as a fuel source. And, and, and in part, it's because Fukushima sort of paralyzed the energy part of policy. Um, but in part, I think it's, it's kind of a perverse effect of this history of disasters. So, so many old hazards has meant less um, urgency around uh, the new ones that are appearing. And they're going to be appearing, uh, you know, as they are in the rest of the world um, in Japan ever more uh, frequently and with ever more intensity. Um, we're also seeing Japan sort of grappling with um, Again, not uniquely, but perhaps um, earlier or, or more intensely than others, a ch you know, changing landscape of vulnerability. So, a growing elderly population, which is is, is uh, presents particular challenges um, in in uh, times of, of natural catastrophes, um, and and the convergence of sort of multiple hazards. So, you know, the layering of um, pandemics atop typhoons or or uh, you know floods atop floods. Um, uh, hazards that hit um, at once. Um, uh, and finally, perhaps um, uh, this is, is the place where Japan is, uh, uh, or the risk that is per a bit unique to Japan, but um, big earthquakes uh, in the Rewa era uh, uh, loom, uh, uh, or the specter of, of big earthquakes haunts sort of the Rewa era, and there are some um, you know, terrifying figures uh, uh, associated with, with the possibility of a, a quake in the Nankai trough zone south of, of, of Honshu and uh, uh, the Tokyo sort of what they call Tokyo inland earthquakes. Um, uh, and, and those are things that, that really worry policymakers here that the damage could, could make um, 311 look tame by, by comparison. Um, it would be especially, um, uh, 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 especially 
devastating um, in Tokyo. And, and, and uh, uh, with that, I will, will turn um, to Tokyo, um, but to talk about Tokyo as, uh, as a mega city uh, and to talk about uh, policy lessons from um, um, Tokyo's, um, Tokyo's experience. If we, if we think back to Tokyo after the war, of course, um, uh, after the fire bombings, a, a city really in shambles, um, three and a half million people of a pre-war population of seven were, were left. Um, uh, fast forward to today, uh, Tokyo is the world's largest city, um, uh, 37 million people in the metropolitan area, 14 million in the, the city proper. Um, and the Tokyo that um, I have the pleasure of living in is, is, is also one of the world's most livable cities. Um, uh, in the, the, the livability index that our um, economist intelligence unit, our, our sister group puts out, Tokyo comes in joint fourth, but, but its population is larger than the, the combined population of, of all the others, um, Adelaide, Auckland, Osaka, and, and Wellington. Um, so, so Tokyo is sort of the combination of livability and scale. Um, this is, of course, uh, again, a, a challenge that, that um, other parts of the world are, are poised to um, uh, are dealing with and, and are poised to, to sort of be dealing with in, in um, ever more intensely uh, in the future. This is just a quick uh, uh, animation to show the, the growth of urban populations. Uh, and, and you can see Tokyo um, uh, uh, early on as a big circle, but um, uh, the rest of the world and, and in particular the rest of Asia um, uh, growing quite quite um, uh, rapidly in its stead, um, and uh, uh, that process is is uh, poised to continue. So, uh, what what can we learn from Tokyo? What can we learn about um, livability at scale? Um, I think there are two uh, uh, two points to 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 look at. One are our planning successes. Um, so, in particular, uh, the emphasis on public transport. Um, the other are um, what you know were, were, would be would be seen by by uh, orthodox uh, 20th century urban planners as, as planning failures. So um, the emergence of dense mixed use neighborhoods, um, you know, uh, uh, standard city planning would, would have you divide uh, uh, divide up uses. Um, uh, Tokyo. And, and Japan tried to do so in, in the wake of both the, the, the great Kanto earthquake of 1923 and the, the Second World War, but um, really whenever able to, um, Tokyo grew too rapidly. The government had too few resources to, to control the process. So instead, um, you got these very lax zoning codes, which allow basically anything to be built other than, you know, uh, uh, um, rather than, than prescribing um, uh, what's permitted. Um, and what we've seen recently is, is a real sort of paradigm shift, especially amongst um, foreign scholars in, in, in terms of how Tokyo is perceived. Um, so these, these problems um, or things that were once considered problems have, have come to be seen as virtues, um, uh, mixed use areas, uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, um, uh, facilitated more equal uh, uh, growth in the city rather than, than, than sort of stratification. Um, a lot of uh, uh, housing activists, in, certainly in, in Western cities that are struggling with housing crises, have um, started to, to look around and notice that um, Tokyo hasn't had a housing crisis in quite the same way. Obviously, demographics is, is a piece of that, but um, uh, so too uh, uh, might be uh, zoning, zoning policies. Um, and finally, the pandemic has sort of focused attention on the square mile um, around us, um, what, what, what's in the neighborhood nearby. Um, this would not be news to, to, to anyone who's read um, folks like, like Jane Jacobs, um, uh, who were really sort of pushing for um, this, pushing against the, the dominant um, uh, urban planning uh, uh, orthodoxy in, in the mid 20th century, um, and in favor of something that um, in retrospect looks a lot like um, what, what Tokyo um, developed. Um, uh, if not by design, by default. Um, so uh, you hear a lot more folks talking these days about a, a Tokyo model, um, you know, uh, in, in developing megacities, uh, um, for example, an urbanist collective in, in Mumbai, whom I spoke with, um, who, who sort of really uh, model a lot of their work there um, on Tokyo. Um, uh, and also for, for aging um, megacities, for developed cities that are, that are uh, facing the, the kinds of 
uh, demographic challenges that, that Japan is uh, uh, is now facing, and, and Tokyo is, is arguably the, the first big uh, big city to um, uh, uh, to see uh, aging and and, and eventually um, shrinking populations at scale. Um, the demographic challenge is, is more visible, of course, um, outside Tokyo in, in the regions at this stage. Um, so I'd like to take us on one more um, uh, trip, if you will, up to Akita Prefecture uh, and to the town of Gojome. Um, this is a picture from uh, Gojome's morning market, which um, uh, has been held regularly um, since the year 1495. Um, quite quiet, as you can see uh, on a recent uh, weekday, uh, weekday morning. Uh, it wasn't always this way. Uh, this is a picture of the same street um, 50 or 60 years ago. So the population of Gojome has shrunk by about half since um, 1990. Uh, and more than half of its remaining residents are over 65 years old. So that makes Gojome uh, one of the oldest towns in Akita, the oldest prefecture in Japan, uh, which is, of course, in turn, uh, the world's oldest country. Um, but Gojome is not an outlier. Um, it's a portent. Uh, every country in the world, according to the UN, is, is experiencing, at this point, growth in the size and proportion of its aging, of its elderly population. Um, at 55 countries, in, including China, are, are projected to see their populations decline um, between now and, and 2050. So demographic change, um, like climate change, it's... it's uh, vast, it's gradual, it seems abstract until it's not. Um, and like climate change, it will demand, I think, a, a real transformation both of institution and of institutions and of, of individual behavior. Um, and, and we're seeing that um, here in Japan. Um, when you talk about demographic change, I think there are, are um, two sort of pieces to to it um, that are that are often lumped together. One is is rising longevity and the other is a falling birth rate. Uh, together, they really demand and what, what uh, 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 Akiyama Hiroko of, of uh, the University of Tokyo's uh, Gerontology Institute puts it, a, a, a new map of life. So, so redesigning infrastructure, healthcare, housing, transport, um, and, and thinking about managing decline rather than generating growth. Um, that, that's the sort of uh, uh, shift that's happened in a lot of um, local governments. Um, the challenge is that it's a common phenomenon, but it affects everyone differently. Um, the context matters both at sort of the individual level and the community level. Um, there's not a, a, a one size fits all model. Um, uh, when we look at aging in particular, um, uh, you know, Japan, uh, uh, th there's a tendency to talk about aging as a problem, um, but the problem is not longevity. Uh, it's, it's in fact great that, that we live longer. The problem is when people live long, but unhealthy or lonely or dependent lives. So the, the, the shift here has been in the direction of, of thinking not only about life expectancy, but thinking about healthy life expectancy. So finding ways for people to stay active longer, both um, at work, um, but also you know, to stay active physically, uh, to stay active socially. Um, when we talk about shrinking, um, when we talk about uh, 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 the falling birth rate part of the, 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 the picture, um, it, it, it's at least in Japan likely to remain below the replacement rate for, for the foreseeable future. And, and even if Japan were able to raise um, its birth rate, uh, the, the regions, um, uh, regional cities and, and rural areas are, are, are going to be experiencing shrinkage. So um, thinking about sort of uh, what that means, you know, are there alternatives to disappearance and, and what, um, what I think you see in a lot of places is, is um, uh, that a critical core, a, a small sort of active group of newcomers can make a difference, that you don't need to replace everyone in a town um, to make a, a viable community. Um, you need a handful of, of active young people coming in. Um, this is a, a, a former school in, in um, elementary school that closed for um, lack of students. Uh, in, in Gojome that uh, uh, a group of, of active young people who've moved in from, from Tokyo and elsewhere in the country have turned into kind of a entrepreneurship hub. Um, and and uh, uh, Gojome has um, seen a, a, a sort of revival of sorts, um, even though uh, its population continues, um, continues to, to shrink. Um, and the people coming in to places like Gojome, um, uh, you know, making the decision to, to, to move there are, I think, really the, the vanguard in many ways. Um, they're thinking about uh, what it means to 
design communities and what it means to live in, in this new um, in this new era in the era of, of uh, sh shrinking populations and, and uh, aging societies. Um, I'm going to skip uh, one section and, and jump forward to um, uh, the economy just to make sure that we have have time for questions and and, and comments. But um, you know the 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 standard uh, view, uh, as as uh, Akimoto-san mentioned in uh, um, in his introduction, uh, is 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 the the shift from Japan as as a as a a booming economy poised to take over uh, the world in, in the 1980s um, to the, the, the bubble bursting and, and the lost decades. Um, uh, you know, public debt ballooning, deflation setting in. Um, and, and a lot of people, I mean, when you look back at, at, at um, what folks were writing in the late 90s and, and early 2000s, a lot of people, especially in, in the US, especially in the West, um, uh, uh, saying Japan's debt was unsustainable, that the BOJ needed to do more to, to boost inflation. Um, and uh, then we see, of course, uh, under um, Kuroda-san uh, at the BOJ, a, a dramatic sort of monetary easing. Um, uh, we see the debt remain um, quite high at, at you know over 200% of GDP for, for, for quite some time. Um, but a strange thing happens. We, we don't have a, or a strange thing, uh, according to the, um, uh, uh, the textbooks of the time, we, we don't have a fiscal crisis. Uh, and we also don't have um, inflation get anywhere near uh, BOJ's 2% target. Um, so uh, as, as the Shirakawa Masaki, the, the, the ex-BOJ governor put it to me, uh, you know, the standard textbook um, needs, needs a few additional chapters. Um, uh, the problems Japan faced um, uh, 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 require some new thinking. And, and, and those problems um, uh, in, in, in many ways have, um, or in different combinations and to different extents have, have um, uh, hit uh, rich countries elsewhere uh, as well. Um, uh, this is this is the uh, uh, classic um, uh, graph showing the convergence of, of uh, ten-year uh, government bond yields um, uh, in in uh, Japan and, and uh, the rest of the G7, um, and you can see uh, everyone becoming a bit more um, uh, Japan-esque. Um, uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, secular stagnation. So this combination of low inflation, low interest rates, low growth. Um, uh, uh, maybe is, is not um, as relevant at, at the moment with uh, inflation peaking in, in the US, but um, financial markets suggest that it'll return soon, that, 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 uh, 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 that this is a, a kind of enduring condition. Um, so as Japan has adapted um, to it and, and, and as Japan's policies have, um, uh, have changed uh, in response to, to, to its um, uh, to its secular stagnation, um, a lot of economists, especially in the West, are, are sort of um, have been learning lessons from Japan's experience and, and have also been seeing Japan's economy in, in a new light. Um, so on the debt side, um, I think Japan uh, has clearly um, uh, suggested that the, Japan's experience clearly suggests that fiscal limits are, are, are not what folks thought they once were. Um, you know, interest rates can stay below growth rates for longer than believed, and, and public debt can stay higher for longer than than, than believed. Um, doing the reporting, uh, you know, I, I, I noticed a real um, cleavage between um, economists um, outside Japan and those inside Japan in terms of, of um, the views about um, uh, uh, the, the, the Japan's ability to continue sort of managing this this debt load in a in a way that that. Um, uh, doesn't lead to crisis. Um, folks outside Japan um, uh, are, are more um, positive about um, Japan's ability to manage than those um, inside Japan, which is an, 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 um, uh, an interesting, uh, interesting contrast. Um, more faith in, in sort of Japanese policymakers amongst folks sitting in Washington, DC, for example, um, than, than those sitting in Tokyo. And it may simply just be a, a, a question of relativity um, uh, uh, if you're sitting in, in a dysfunctional capital um, uh, uh, as Washington um, uh, has been for, for the last few years. Um, uh, Japan uh, uh, looks um, pretty pretty functional by comparison. Um, uh, on, the, on the inflation or deflation or low inflation side, um, uh, a lot of people, you know, looking back and asking the question of why um, all of the old, 
the, the, the money coming out of the BOJ um, didn't produce the, the sort of expected textbook result. Um, there are two, uh, two pieces um, unique to Japan um, or, or, or particular to Japan. One is, is sort of inflation expectations and this idea that once they're, they're anchored around zero, getting them up is hard. Uh, and the second is the, the, the nature of the labor market, the, the, um, the inflexibility of the labor market and, and the preference of unions here for stability of employment over wage hikes. Um, but there's also sort of structural factors. And again, this is where um, maybe Japan's experience um, coincides with others. So um, demographic shifts um, uh, uh, being, being a piece of it. Um, and, and this is where I think you start to see the, the, the reappraisal um, of uh, Japan's performance um, uh, more broadly. Um, when you look at, at nominal growth, it's quite sluggish, but when you adjust for, for population, um, Japan uh, doesn't look quite so bad at all. Um, in fact, in the decade between 2010 and 2019, uh, its average uh, GDP per capita growth rate was the third highest in, in the G7. Um, uh, that's where you get um, comments like this from uh, uh, folks like Paul Krugman. Um, at the same time, um, uh, things might not be quite so bad as they seemed, uh, but they could clearly uh, could clearly be better. Um, uh, there are a number of reforms, and, and we can get into them uh, in in the Q and A that that uh, 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 that are, are are lying out there for for Japan's leaders um, uh, in the Reiwa era um, to to pick up. Uh, and I think one of the big questions um, looking forward uh, is whether uh, Japanese politics in, in, in uh, its current state, and, and, and by that I mean in a state of, of um, uh, a lack of, uh, utter lack of, of competition, um, whether the, the marketplace for ideas uh, in Japanese politics is, is functioning enough um, uh, uh, to produce and, and, and push forward um, the kinds of reforms that, that Japan um, would need for, for uh, uh, Reiwa to be um, uh, even, even brighter. Um, and I think just, just one final, um, uh, final point um, to, to, to leave with is, is to conclude with uh, talking to folks um, across Japan, I think there's a lot more appetite for um, uh, a lot more appetite for bigger change, for systemic change, um, for fundamentally rethinking um, uh, uh, some 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 long-held shibboleths at the local level and 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 in regions um, where uh, especially sort of demographic trends um, have advanced further than than in Tokyo. Um, I think there's a a, a real sense um, that that I have come away with a real sense that society is, is changing faster than the you know, established powers are. Um, you see that uh, on social issues, for example, you know, attitudes towards um, uh, gay rights and, and, and towards family law, where, where the LDP is clearly out of step um, with uh, voters. And, and, and the result is that uh, a lot of people, especially young people, um, are feeling that they can't change the system, that the national political system is not responsive. Um, and so they uh, uh, are focusing their efforts um, uh, elsewhere. Um, they, they go into business, they go into civil society, um, they focus on their communities, um, they don't see uh, a place for them in, in, deciding, um, uh, in deciding politics or, 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 or the fate of the nation. And I think in, in many ways that is, is um, uh, one of the biggest risks uh, uh, for Japan going forward. Um, I will we'll stop there and, and uh, 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 look forward to, to hearing your, um, your questions, uh, um, Akimoto-san and, and others. Well, Noah, thank you very much. I certainly have uh, uh, lots of questions. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, covering a wide uh, a range of important issues regarding Japan uh, from the big uh, uh, picture point. Uh, uh, we have... Uh, Lots of questions, and uh, uh, first uh, uh, we're going to go to uh, uh, Joe Joe Nye, uh, professor, distinguished service professor at uh, Harvard University. Joe, um, I thought that was a terrific presentation, and I liked it when I first read it uh, in the Economist um, about a year ago. Rich Armitage and I published a report 
uh, calling for a more equal alliance between the US and Japan. And one of the things we suggested was greater intelligence sharing. For example, uh, we said we should think of Japan being part of the five eyes. We were thinking of that in aspirational terms because both legal structures and public attitudes up with, let's say, the uh, common view we have with Britain or the other five high partners. But I guess the question for you is how much have attitudes changed? I mean, you, you described there's a, it's a gradual evolution, but um, uh, what do you see as, as evolving in terms of Japanese attitudes on something as sensitive as intelligence sharing or cooperating in uh, cybersecurity and so forth? Uh, where is public opinion and elite opinion on that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Knight. Uh, uh, it's it's a great question. Um, I, I think there's 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 clearly a, a cleavage of sorts um, between elite opinion and, and public opinion, um, uh, which which maybe is to be expected on an issue like this. But um, talking to Japanese policymakers, I think there's a lot of appetite for for exactly um, uh, uh, exactly the kind of uh, uh, closer cooperation and closer intelligence sharing that that, that you you uh, uh, you and and, and uh, uh, ambassador Armitage have suggested um with the obvious caveat that folks here understand uh, of course the, the 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 legal limitations as well um but i think there's there's a lot of um a lot of discussion a lot of worrying a lot of uh, thinking about um uh, about foreign and security policy amongst the elite um, when I talk to politicians, when I talk to officials, when I talk to policymakers, it's at the very top of their minds. Um, I don't think that's the, the, the case for the public, um, uh, you know, despite um, uh, uh, despite the public's wariness of China, um, the issues when you look at, at the past um, elections here, election cycles here have been um, uh, very domestically focused and, and you know, LDP politicians um, who I talk to about um, security issues will, will will turn around and say, "But I would never, I would never have this conversation with voters. This this isn't what the public wants to hear." And and um, I think there's real concern amongst um, uh, amongst uh, uh, senior policymakers that that perhaps the elite is getting a little little bit far ahead of of where um, uh, where the public is. And 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 um, there are some some questions about sort of. If a crisis were to occur, and obviously it would depend on the nature of that crisis, but if a crisis were to occur, um, uh, whether the, the public and the elite would 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 see eye eye to eye, um, and I think that probably extends to um, uh, uh, exactly the fields you're you're mentioning as well. Thank you, Joe. Anything to add? No, I, I, I my impression as well, but I I no one knows a lot more about it than I do. Thank you very much for joining. I really appreciate it. Uh, next, uh, we go to uh, Emma Charlotte Avery of uh, Congressional Research Service. Emma, Happy New Year. Um, nice to see you. Um, hi, Noah. Um, nice to see you as well. And thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, I think I spoke to you probably over a year ago when you had first arrived in Tokyo. and. I wonder about your perception of the pandemic from inside Japan and if that experience has accelerated any of the, the trends that, that you mentioned here. I mean, there's a sense from over here, um, you know, that Japan has sort of retreated. I mean, as a public health measure, perhaps, you know, closing its borders. Um, but do you think that there's sort of a hardening of this old sense of keeping foreigners and disease out um, um, from your experience there, like reversion to this island nation mentality, despite the hosting of the Olympics? Um, and do you think it's damaging to its links with the rest of the world? And I'll just say, not to stoke this rivalry, but um, it's been a really different experience for, uh, for me, for the Koreans. Like the Koreans are here in Washington, they're inviting delegations and scholars to Korea. Um, and basically, I just really want to get back to Japan, which is the <laughs> underlying um, uh, basic uh, concept here. But uh, but I wonder about how you think that the experience of the pandemic um, has changed Japan's outlook and behavior. 
Thanks. Yeah, um, thank you for um, thank you for for joining us. And it's nice to see you too. And and thank you for the great um, the great question. Um, I, I think you're not the only one um, uh, who's frustrated, and 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 um, it's clear that that uh, this hard line sort of border policy has has done a lot of damage, both at a, a you know personal level for a lot of people. Um, and probably, you know, to Japan studies, um, a, a whole kind of mini generation that hasn't been able to get into the country. Um, that, that and, and, you know, you, you see headlines about, um, you know, things like uh, signs about foreigners in elevators and things like that. But I, I honestly wouldn't make too much of it. And, and I was quite surprised, um, you know, talking to folks, um, especially outside Tokyo, um, about immigration in the course of this reporting, and I, I sort of skipped that section of the presentation because um, I ran out of time. But you know, uh, it would have been a really easy moment for um, local leaders um, to take the sort of immigration question and say, "Well, now is not the time to talk about it. We have a pandemic. You know, we need to protect public health." Um, uh, and what I found was a lot of, um, especially again outside Tokyo, I mean, places where in fact um, local economies are. are you know, more um, dependent on, on foreign labor. Um, people saying the opposite. Um, uh, people saying now's the time to be thinking about um, redefining immigration policy in a more you know cohesive and and, and um, effective way. Now's the time uh, uh, you know to be um, bringing more people from outside in, um, and that the the kind of national government is is um, uh, um, missing um, missing this opportunity. Um, I mean, just sort of to highlight one quote, I mean, uh, from, from uh, Satake Norihisa, who was the governor of, of Akita, who um, descends from a, a, a samurai family that goes back to the 12th century, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, you know, exactly the kind of person um, who might very easily um, slide into kind of Shimaguni um, um, style um, uh, thinking one might expect. Um, and, when I asked him about, you know, immigration policy, um, he was was quite forceful in, in saying that uh, for his prefecture's future, it's key to bring in people from outside the prefecture, including people from overseas, um, and not just as sort of raw labor, but but really that we need to think about um, how to integrate um, and, and and think about immigration in a more long-term way. So, um, you know, I think. Uh, I, 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 well, I share the frustration and, and, um, and acknowledge all the, I mean, it's, it's clear all the ways that it's been damaging. I wouldn't, um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, make, make too much of, of um, uh, it changing the, the sort of longer term trajectory, but that's just my impression. Thank you very much. I have uh, uh, actually endured uh, a two weeks quarantine and joining you from uh, Tokyo and uh, a surge of uh, infections on the basis, uh, uh, US basis certainly uh, uh, doesn't help uh, Japanese psych much, but uh, uh, there's a lot to uh, uh, think about. Uh, next, uh, we're going to go to uh, Ambassador Melan Verbier. She is uh, executive uh, uh, director of Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace and Security, Melan. Happy, happy New Year. Happy New Year, and thank you so much. And uh, Noah, thank you for that extraordinary comprehensive overview that you just uh, presented uh, to us. I want to um, ask my question, sort of bringing together demographics, uh, the economy, and the last piece that you mentioned in terms of social attitudes, uh, particularly among young people. Uh, and and if I recall, in reading your report, you, you also touched on the fact that uh, the treatment of women has often been or continues to be rather retrograde um, in, in, in terms of the larger uh, view of things. And so my question has to do with bringing more women into the workforce full time, uh, which would, in, in terms of what most studies would indicate, uh, increase the birth rate. Uh, but to do that, you really need uh, a more uh, significant commitment to childcare. Uh, you need to bring down uh, the kind of hours that men uh, spend in the workforce. Uh, and it has a lot to do with the attitudes today among young people, where women are 
exiting, if you will, uh, the prospect of uh, contributing uh, to uh, parenthood and young men are having problems with uh, the way the, uh, the workforce functions. So what, what's your sense of the evolution in all of this? You use the word transformation a lot. Uh, do you see, how do you see this moving forward? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's 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 a great question, and and um, I'm I'm glad you brought it up. And I, I think it's it's clearly sort of uh, one of one of one of if not the um, uh, area that that um, uh, this government and, and future governments in 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 this era ought to be focusing on. Um, uh, sadly, I I don't see um, much discussion uh, of it. Um, from Kishida, uh, from this new administration, um, in all of the talk of new capitalism, um, which of course uh, uh, isn't looking all that new to begin with, um, there isn't much at all um, uh, on uh, uh, the role of women or, or, or women's role in the workforce in particular. There isn't a whole lot um, uh, about the precarity of, of you know, 40% of, of the labor force. Um, so I, I think that's a, a missed opportunity um, a lot of it, um, a lot of it comes back um, to, to labor market reform and, and uh, to to uh, uh, to making uh, to, to, to getting getting past this this kind of two tier system, um, which of course traps um, a lot of women in, in part time work. Um, and I think you know, in terms of attitudes, it's, it's striking when you walk into, for example, um, uh, startups in Japan. Um, uh, granted, there are fewer of them than, than uh, maybe in Silicon Valley, but um, a growing number. And when you walk in, one of the things that's, that's striking is, is the number of women um, and the number of women in um, uh, real um, roles, which is to say not um, being asked to uh, uh, serve tea or welcome men into um, rooms. Um, so, you know, I think you see smart young Japanese women voting with their feet uh, and voting against the sort of traditional corporate structures, which even after years and years of, of promises have um, uh, failed to, to sort of deliver um, on those opportunities. Um, uh, so I think they're, they're looking elsewhere. Uh, I, I hope um, uh, the government does uh, 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 much of what you suggested um, uh, 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 in, in terms of, of, sort of delivering on this, this, um, this promise more broadly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go to Minister Ishigaki of the Japanese Embassy in Washington. Minister Ishigaki. Um, hello, uh, Dr. Akimoto, and also Noah. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity, and Happy New Year to you both. Um, as much as I like to ask Noah about the climate policy as well as the Taiwan Strait, I save that for another time. But uh, I was particularly intrigued by your observation about Japan's over, uh, urban policy that can be replicated or modeled uh, after by other countries. You mentioned in your presentation about the uh, Indian experts uh, looking into Tokyo model as an example, but I wonder whether there are any other relevance uh, of the Japanese urban policy or city planning that can be seen uh, in the new light from developed countries like the US or Europe. Uh, I can easily, oh, the only thing that I could think is maybe the uh, public safety, you know, lower crime and maybe community policing. But uh, of course, there's a huge issue about here on affordability of housing, but I wasn't particularly sure that is anything that is so successful in Japan. So I'm being very uh, curious to hear your observations and what you have learned uh, through this reporting. Thank you so much. Uh, great to see you and, and uh, uh, nice to see you in, in your new home in, in, in DC. Um, so it, it's a great question. I, I think the lessons um, are, are slightly different looking mm -hmm. at, at sort of developing megacities and cities that have all already sort of developed or, or taken their um, mature forms. Um, it's a lot harder to, to um, implement some of the things um, that folks, uh, you know, are looking at with respect to Mumbai um, in, a, mm -hmm. in a city that's already um, developed. Um, so I think the, the lessons for um, rich megacities, developed megacities have more to do with, with this sort of next phase of the process. So the, the end of urbanization or the, the sort of what happens when cities age and shrink. Um, uh, and, and those are, are, are uh, uh, things that Tokyo is, is really just, just starting to, to figure out. 
um, uh, in terms of, of um, you know, one piece has to do with, with technology and, and, you know, talking to Governor Koike, she's quite um, uh, excited about uh, uh, the ways that, um, you know, uh, uh, smart city technology can, can help um, uh, city governments, municipal governments uh, manage uh, services, deliver services in sort of more efficient ways. So that's one, one potential part of the solution. And, and there's clearly a lot of, you know, collaboration that could and, and, and mm. Um, should be happening um, between cities on 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 that, um, uh, and uh, in terms of sort of housing crises or housing affordability, I mean, I, I think the piece that um, uh, folks I talk to in in outside Japan point to is is really just the housing supply. I mean, the, the housing stock, and when you look at the number of of um, buildings, number of the, the amount of housing being built in Tokyo versus um, the San Francisco Bay Area, for example. Um, uh, it's quite striking. Um, it, it, it's you know it's not um, directly applicable, but um, but there clearly um, are are some some lessons to be learned about um, mm. uh, what happens with um, more permissive zoning or with with less sort of nimbiest um, protection. Uh, what happens to to uh, housing stock in the city? Thank you so much. I look forward to reading more stories from Tokyo. All the best. Thank you, Thank you very much for joining. Next, uh, we're going to go to uh, uh, Mr. Tomohiko Taniguchi, who's a professor at the Keio University. Mr. Taniguchi, okay, Mr. Yeah, thank you thanks. very much, Akimoto-san. Thank you, thank you for having me. And um, it's good to follow my friend's question, Ishigaki-san's question, to Noah. Uh, I'm on a JST time zone. Uh, are you on the same time zone, Noah? I am. Uh, we're 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 into Friday, uh, January seventh here in Tokyo. So. All right. <laughs> thanks, thanks for sticking uh, sticking with us so late. First of all, uh, I found your special coverage very much fascinating, uh, as uh, many people uh, uh, think the same. Uh, especially that uh, your emphasis on the so-called livability of Tokyo um, intrigues me. Why so? Is my first question, because you seem to be uh, putting a lot of emphasis on uh, how things uh, have been viewed by uh, uh, foreigners about Tokyo's livability. The second part of my question is very much dramatically different about the differences, if you can see, between Abe and Kishida when it comes to Japan's geopolitical posture. Uh, are you of a view that Kishida is more or less carrying on the same sort of trajectory that was set by Abe when it comes to China, Taiwan, the United States, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Tenguchi-san, for, for joining and for those great questions. Um, I, I mean, I think uh, as for the question about why write about Tokyo, um, I think for certainly for for readers um uh, 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 readers who don't live in japan um tokyo is is uh is a clear sort of symbol and and uh, for me was a, a a way to to draw people um further into the report um uh, and to get people thinking about um things they might be familiar with in japan but but thinking about them through through a different lens um, so uh, uh, maybe a, a, a journalistic device as much as, as anything, but um, but I think it's it's also as you know as, as uh, uh, we, we we just um, just discussed, um, it is a, a, a good um, source of of, uh, of lessons, and I think it it, it points to as as um, the rest of the report sort of gets into it points in it points in the direction of the the, the, sort of the commonalities, the common um, uh, uh, the common demographic challenges in particular, um, urban growth uh, and, and, and aging and shrinking and, and how they sort of manifest. Um, so, you know, thinking about why Tokyo is, is livable and, and trying to unpack um, what the policies are that, that lead to that rather than, than sort of defaulting to Japanese-ness or, 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 you know, the fact that um, Japanese people are clean and punctual and line up on time, and that's why Tokyo works. Um, so, trying to sort of push beyond those um, surface level explanations and and um, un unpack um, uh, the, the the policy side seems seems like a useful 
um, useful service uh, for, for, for our readers. Um, as far as the, the, the geo sort of strategic geopolitical question goes, um, I, I, my sense is, and, and both of you would, would, would know much better than I, but my, my sense is that Kishida um, isn't really leading on um, policies in, in, in any respect. Um, he's kind of a manifestation of where the um, consensus uh, within the LDP is. Um, he's, he's kind of uh, uh, channeling uh, wherever that, that middle ground is. And, and I think you see it shifting um, uh, perhaps um, from the late sort of uh, uh, late Abe period um, with respect to, to China and Taiwan. Um, again, I don't think it's because Kishida himself is, is um, uh, 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 gone in a different direction from Abe, but um, uh, events have, have, led, um, uh, 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 have led policymakers and, and led uh, folks in the LDP to, to, um, uh, to be talking and, and thinking more about things like economic security, uh, uh, to be putting a, a, you know, human rights czar in place, um, to be starting dialogues with um, uh, 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 political parties in, in Taiwan. So um, I, I see that as, I suppose it's an, an, an extension of um, an evolution, further evolution of sort of the trajectory that, that Abe said. Um, um, uh, but uh, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I have yet to see sort of uh, Kishida, uh, uh, what Kishida's vision is um, uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, geopolitics. Mr. Thank Taniguchi, you. stay on, much. stay on, Mr. Taniguchi. We have a, a very limited time, but let me ask you a quick question. Uh, you asked the question uh, uh, in the individual context, uh, Kishida versus Abe, but uh, I just wonder if uh, a stereotyped view of uh, uh, Kochikai as a, a kind of dovish uh, uh, policy, foreign policy group uh, still stands uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida, as well as Foreign Minister Hayashi. Just wanted uh, you to educate us. Um, the factional politics is in its uh, evolution. Certainly Kishida grew as a faithful student of people like Koga Makoto, and that influence still lingers. Uh, Koga has been known to be very much soft uh, at the least towards China or uh, towards anything uh, challenging. So uh, for that matter, Kishida inherits the Kochikai factional uh, characteristics, if you like. However, Kishida must know as much as anyone else about the um, lingering challenges in the region and beyond, because he was the one that spent longer years than usual uh, as foreign minister. Um, so I'm still uh, in a mixed emotions when it comes to how one should view Kishida. And if you look at Kishida's economic policies, uh, you may uh, say the same. Uh, Kishida's new capitalist economy, as Noah pointed out, uh, is hard to decipher for me. Uh, what sort of elements are new and what are not new uh, makes uh, one wonder uh, about uh, his economic policies. Uh, he sometimes says that growth is the number one priority. The next uh, day, he says uh, distribution is important. So, um, I would very much like uh, Mr. Kishida uh, to be more, uh, let's say, articulate about those issues. At the moment, the public are very much kind towards Kishida. The uh, perceptions, uh, ratings, uh, pro uh, uh, ratings, uh, ratings, uh, ratings of uh, Kishida uh, have soared. Um, so uh, he is in a uh, very much good position to win the uh, House of uh, uh, Councillors elections due in July, uh, I will uh, see uh, what, what sort of um, posture Kishida will have uh, after the uh, July elections. Thank you very much. You, you spoke to us uh, uh, a year and a half ago and I'll invite you back. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Noah, uh, I have uh, uh, one last question uh, uh, before we close the event. Uh, uh, 
The question is a uh, uh, um, bird's eye view of Japanese politics that, uh, um, you know, advanced democracies uh, are having a, a crisis uh, in the United States, even uh, uh, the result of uh, uh, elections in uh, uh, question uh, by many people in Europe as well, riots follows and uh, uh, some uh, uh, politicians even uh, 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 resort to uh, uh, violence and that sort of things. Japan just had uh, uh, a lower house election, general election. Uh, you know, there have been lots of uh, uh, criticism of Japanese election system, one party system, um, you know, uh, uh, factionalism is so strong, second generation, third generation uh, uh, politician and so on and so forth. What is your uh, uh, evaluation of uh, uh, democracy in Japan in general? Um, the big context question. Yeah, uh, it's a big question. It's a it's an important one. Um, uh, look, I mean, obviously, Japan has has avoided some of the um, at least for now has avoided some of the the, the ailments that you uh, rightly point out in the West. The the popularism, the populism, the, the polarization, the the, the sort of uh, uh, willingness to attack democratic institutions, um, and and uh, that's that's uh, uh, should be commended uh, certainly. Um, that said, I think Japanese politics has has um, some rather serious problems of its own. And, and um, just to, to share an anecdote, I mean, uh, uh, when I came here um, from uh, after seven years of, of covering Putin's Russia, I was really surprised. Um, I felt a sort of strange déjà vu because. I heard a lot of people um, uh, when I talked to, to voters or when I talked to, especially to, to younger people um, and asked them about politics, a lot of people saying something that I heard um, very often in, in, in Putin's Russia, which is, well, I can't change anything. My vote doesn't matter. Um, and I think that's a really worrying sign, um, this uh, sense of, of, of uh, you know, some people call it apathy, but I don't know that it has, uh, apathy is, is really fair to voters, but this sense um, amongst um, a, a, a large and growing uh, share of the population that they don't have a voice or a choice in the political process. And, and um, I think that's the, as, as I say it, the biggest, um, the biggest problem. And, and, you know, there's a, a, a risk that that kind of mild frustration or, 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 um, uh, uh, that that mild frustration could metastasize into something, um, uh, you know, more uh, nasty here in the future too. Um, uh, you know, again, uh, there's nothing uniquely Japanese that that um, prevents uh, society from uh, having uh, divisions or, or clashes. Um, you don't have to go back that far in, in Japanese history to to find those periods. So. Um, well, Noah, thank you very much for uh, uh, spending uh, lots of time. Uh, uh... Both of us are uh, past midnight and uh, uh, we should go to bed, but uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, generously uh, uh, sharing your thought. I also would like to uh, uh, thank all the participants uh, uh, who uh, uh, joined us uh, uh, from uh, Washington and elsewhere. We had a uh, uh, wonderful, thanks to Noah, we were able to have a wonderful beginning of uh, year 2022 and we continue to uh, uh, do our best to uh, uh, deliver uh, 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 speakers, uh, uh, expert speakers on important issues. So Noah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, everyone who participated, I thank you very much as well. Bye-bye. Thank you.